So my name's Seb Chan. I'm the direct, director and CEO at the Australian Centre for, Centre for, Centre for the Move, uh, Moving Image. Um, my museum's located on the lands of the people of the Kulin Nation, uh, and I pay and, um, and I pay kind of my uh, respect to any for, for First Nations people who are here with us today as well. Um, the work that I'm going to talk talk about is the work of many many collect collectives and other people. Some of whom are in uh, the room. I'd like to acknowledge Aaron de Cope, one of the geniuses behind much of some of the work I'll talk talk about midway through. I think. Digital work, like much creative practice, is collective work, and we don't acknowledge that enough. So my museum's in the centre of Melbourne um, at Federation Square, um, and it's uh, four levels, four galleries, two cinemas. So we have a very, uh, very sizable cinemas. We run labs. We also have a co-working space where creators from the move from the moving image world, so filmmakers, video game makers. Um, script writers, designers work amongst us running their businesses. Uh, we have a web gallery uh, and a streaming service as well. Um, interestingly, in our redesign and rebuild and rebranding, uh, we now call ourselves your museum of screen culture. And that, and that prefacing of the word your rather than the Australian museum of screen culture was very important in really that we are a museum for you. And we, were a, we are a museum that philosophically realises that screen, screen culture is in your pocket and on your television. And in the museum, it's an art, artificial environment, much as Kamini was saying, that this sort of divide between art and culture. We are a uh, museum of both art and, and, and culture. Um, I'm not going to talk about the fancy things. I'm going to talk about the prosaic things. So we have a large collection of film, of course. We also have a large collection of video games. This is a video game that I actually grew up with, so that's dating me a little, little bit. Uh, I played as a very small kid. Um, that comes on a cassette tape. Those are incredibly stable things. They're actually very, very stable. I can store those in a fridge for a long, long period of time. Stuff that arrives now, our contemporary, our contemporary art arts uh, commissions that arrive on these drives last about three, or three to five years without intervention. So the digital works are in fact more fragile than the other works we have. And here are some of the recent, recent commissions, Daniel Crooks, Rico Rennie. Um, we have things from uh, 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 multi-channel video works to uh, video games. This one on the bottom uh, right is a video game, uh, net, networked video game crit, uh, critique of the blockchain. Um, we also make, make fun exhibitions that we tour. So this is one that we just launched just before I got on the plane to get here. Um, so we do things about film culture. This is about women in film, and uh, it's, it's quite a, 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 fab, a fabulous ex exhibition. So we build these ex ex exhibitions to work in, Aust you know, um, in Australia, but then they also tour, tour globally. So that's part of our model. We're, we're, we're publicly financed, but we make these exhibitions to tour as part of our revenue model. So if you'd like this ex 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 exhibition in your, your city, get in touch. Anyway, it's great. Uh, and Gina Davis came over and launched it, which was fantastic too. Um, but this talk uh, is more about technology, people, museums, hopes and dreams. Now, of course, this is not the first, first, first time we've asked, will te technology trans transform museums? Hopes, dreams and fears of fears about computers in museums goes right, right back to the 1960s. In 1968, the Met held, held a conference on computers and um, museums. And it was very important. And like many things from the late kind of 1960s, we still feel its uh, resonance today. <laughs> the University of Illinois, uh, sort of Illinois presented a, a project there. Uh, amusingly called Plato, which was also the name of one of the startups that we saw the other day. Um, Plato was programmed to kind of logic for automated teaching applications developed for the Iliac computer, which connected to 20 student terminals. And here we see the birth of user experience uh, in a uh, user experience design in tech in museums. And many of these questions you can see on the right hand side where you ask about the, sub the, sub the subject matter, the style, the, the related works. These are things we still talk about now. Um, despite this, the IT revolution in museums didn't really amount to much. Museums are surprisingly resistant <laughs> to technological change. <laughs> our friends in the, lib in the, our friends in the lib uh, library sec sector though uh, uh, were 
uh, transformed far more than us. Libraries were transformed by computerization, and this transformation was linked, deeply linked, to professionalization, standardization, um, and data was created, and, met and metadata, and lots and lots of metadata. In fact, libraries are, or were, predominantly metadata. Libraries have also been at the foref 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 forefront of most of the quest questions we ask ourselves today. They've kind of, they've kind of managed to cope with the, the digital at kind of the core of their biz business better than us. Have, um, um, having dealt with this existential crisis two, uh, two, uh, two decades ago with, with the arrival of search and e-books. E e e e e e e Public libraries have radically changed. Some now employ social workers and even loan out wireless connections to their communities. Would, would museums consider such a transformation of purpose? In Australia, we talk about the glam sector. And that means galleries, libraries, archives, and uh, museums. And, in, and, and this is a really neat, neat way of saying that those four fields share more now than ever before, even when we in the gallery sector or the art museum sector do not think, 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 think kind of we do. In the 1980s, 90s, 1990s particularly, it was the time of another te technological pe uh, period of change. CD-ROMs, the, inter the interactive kiosks and encyclopedias. I did a little search um, in e eBay. The multi multimedia wave of the 1990s drew further attention to the question of who are kind of museums for? This was a moment of CD-ROMs and, in, in, uh, and these interactive kiosks and the museum collection as an encyclopedia. This was also a temporary bubble that didn't make fund, fundamental changes to institutions and it fitted in, um, um, in kind of to exist, um, existing publishing work workflows. And you can see here the uh, features of this fabulous CD-ROM. State of kind of the art soft, software allows extensive three-dimensional viewing, 600 artefacts from the Smithsonian, which I believe Aaron had 28 million art artefacts when we were working there together. 137 million. So this CD-ROM CD seems quite expensive for anyone. So when I started my career in museums, I was working here at the Powerhouse Museum, a big design science history museum in Australia. And I made a lot of the second wave of museum web websites. <laughs> And by the, by the time I found myself working in museums, the, op the opportunities of the web had begun to shift from the web as a publishing medium to the web as a social space. Here are some of the websites that I built for many, uh, for the museum and many other places. You can see the word metadata in the, in the middle there. In fact, my career began with building tools that would interoperate more, um, more like libraries. Also built, built things in Flash and we were optimistic. <laughs> Maybe at first it was because people, it was people like us who were the users of the web. Um, and we were quite optimistic. One of the real, real, real projects that broke through was this. So this is one that my team did in 2005. We did a lot of work on openness, open access, open, open, open to culture and creative, uh, creative commons. This worked off, that, off the early web's model, a, a sort of view source model of culture compared to one where the openness needs uh, needs kind of to be requested. And at that, that, that point, setting out the default position of open was seen as, uh, as, as a good thing. So uh, this was uh, a problem that I was faced with. Uh, one of our curators at the Powerhouse came to my team and said, look, Seb, we have this huge collection of uh, swatch books, fabric swatch, swatch books. These are all out of, out, of, out, of, out, of, out of copyright and all these fashion kind of students are coming up to us saying, look, uh, we, we want to take photos of these to make new garments from them. And of course, getting these out was beginning to damage the books. And of course, the metadata about the books, these were catalogued as books. But in fact, the users, these you know, design students, wanted to use the swatches from them. So 2005, we launched the electronic swatch, swatch book. And you could um, uh, search and download uh, very high kind of resolution for the time images of the patterns. You could also nav uh, nav uh, navigate the patterns by color. And you could navigate the patterns uh, by tags. So the, the uh, design students were also tagging and describing the Paisley pattern 
as Paisley, which of, which of course the, the uh, curators had not catalogued this as. It was catalogued as page 57 of book X, right? So we, 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 we applied that model to the entire collection of the powerhouse in 2005. Visitors and experts from the far corners of um, the, inter the internet told us thing, thing, things about our collections that we either didn't know or hadn't, um, um, hadn't had time to put into our TMS or database. They, they tagged our images when we'd, we'd given the chance. And this, this, this gave, gave us and me the, uh, the perception that this, this great op optimism about the, in uh, the, 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 the internet was, uh, was, was warrant warranted. Here's an example. So this is a comb from the Powerhouse's collection. This is circa 2007. And you can see that we've, in there, run um, te text mining tools to auto-tag many of the people and places in the collection, uh, the, the, the collection record. We had subject cataloging. Um, and we allowed users to add tags. And one, 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 one morning I came into work and someone had added this uh, tag to this uh, comb, which was a URL. And that URL took us from the comb to the digitised news newspaper collections in the N National Library of Australia and to an article about the museum collecting that comb. So this was where a user had made that connection between the record we had, we, we'd, we'd put up on the web and, some, and someone else had put up on the web. This was seen as a great, amazing thing then. Also, digitised assets were put to great other uses too. And we made uh, immersive ex exhibition experiences like this. This is from 2010. Uh, Paula Bray and her, her, her team, who was working for me, uh, was using photographs from our, um, our fashion collection to build this great uh, immersive experience with a fashion, photog uh, fashion photographer, Bruno Benini, uh, with six projectors and a bunch of mirrors. Uh, 2011, I moved to the U US and my team had a similar approach and did um, similar things. Coop, the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum had fabulous things in its uh, collection. Lots of weird things, this cricket, this cricket cage and the mas mas mascot of Aaron and uh, my, my team. <laughs> this one, um, the spanking cat. Anyway, the problem with the, with the Cooper Hewitt was this. They were doing this $92, uh, $92 million redevelopment and renovation, but even when that was finished, that was going to be the uh, reality. Now, the Cooper Hewitt's collection began as a teaching collection. The, 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 the um, Hewitt sisters had collected these works from Europe for them to be copied and used by others. And that was a great... Um, uh, part of the DNA which allowed so much of the tra trans transformation to happen. And I think this image allowed my team to communicate with the rest of the museum and also the Smithsonian too, that the work we were doing to make accessible the collection and usable, that it wasn't out, outside of the very historic roots of the museum too, where it was used as a teaching, uh, teaching collection. Uh, 2011, a very small amount of the, the, the collection was digitised, and by the time Aaron and I left, uh, most, m most of it had been digitised by these fabulous people here. When we were working at um, the museum, of course, the problem was cataloguing. Now, the Coopy Hewitt has a very large number of prints in its collection, a significant amount. Now, without a digitised image, most of the collection records looked like this. No image, this is a print we, 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 we acquired it in 1901. Um, so Aaron, who's over there, uh, built the fabulous um, collection browser, which inspired many other uh, museums around the, around, uh, the world. Um, this was one where natural language was part of how we uh, described things using the very basic metadata. And I can tell you the metadata was incredibly basic. So this launched, I think, about 2012. Um, where we made things available, uh, we, we, we told you about the way things were. Uh, we brought back that colour search, so that colour, that, that, that method, me methodology of searching by colour that came from the, ele the, ele the electronic swatch, swatch book uh, in two, uh, 2005 was res res resuscitated and modernised, and you could browse by colour. You could browse by time, 
you could browse by people, you could even connect all of those people to the people from uh, the powerhouses collection. Uh, this in the galleries looked a bit like this too, so that great wallpaper collection that Cooper Hewitt had did digitizing it, uh, some work with local projects allowed us to create, a, create an immersive experience that allowed people to see how wallpapers were made, but also importantly see the historic wallpapers in a con, con in a context of a room rather, rather, rather than a swatch. So this really brought this notion of the, the, the museum as an interface, both physical and, and uh, social, to not kind of just a physical collection, but also that uh, digitized reproduction of a collection. This was also a time, the real transformation didn't occur with the, with the de desktop web, but with um, but the arrival of mobile, the visitor, and what they could, could, con, could, could contribute was a, was a focus. But then visitors arrived at our museums with net, networked cameras. And in two years, almost all of the no, um, no photography signs around the world vanished. And they, and they were replaced with no kind of selfie sticks signs. <laughs> and all that visitor photography was good advertising. This has gone so, so far that now the, ex, the experience of art was transformed with that one, uh, two, uh, two one that was primarily, or at, um, um, or at kind of least initially, through someone else's images on their kind of social, social feed. And these are some photos that I took and shared from my visit a few days ago to the uh, De Young exhibition. That's not always welcomed. And this was also in the kind of De Young exhibition in the visitor, feed, uh, visitor feedback. The multi-sensory, three-dimensional experience is now uh, brought, brought, brought to us through our tiny portable rec 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 rectangles. And in many ways, our experience of art is al already this. Now, you may, may be able to also claim that this, this, this was what really popularised be popularized the idea of experience kind of design within museums. And for the first uh, time, exhibition designers and curators needed to pay real attention to our, our kind of visitors and the, way, I mean, the way they behaved. And the design firms who used to, used to primarily work uh, with science museums began to do work for art, 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 art museums. Now, the internet obviously is beginning to change the world. You, you can't sep separate the, in the, in the internet and the world anymore. And because I'm running out of time, I will zip through these. We're in an interesting period, though. When this work was occurring, it was in this period of cheap capital, and it was a low interest rate, 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 rate bubble. And I think being here in the valley, this is very much the case. Um, it's a little bit diff different now. So here in Australia, in uh, Melbourne, uh, my teams uh, in my old uh, role were, experienced, were experimenting with AI tools for about six, six years, with open kind of source commercial, as well as in pilots with some of the major, major players. And our sense has been to get a sense of the, 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 the potential future we need to dabble in the, in the present, to figure out its um, limit, limitations and to figure out which of um, those lim limitations are ones of dating and computing power, which can be solved, and which are more, philosoph uh, more philosophical. The results have been mixed, and our experience with the larger larger players has 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 actually been uh, pretty poor, and that's because of mis misaligned goals. This is uh, running on the on the museum's uh, video collection, um, the uh, Google Video Tools from 20 to 2017, and it's pulling up what it thinks is in these scenes with a percentage of um, certainty. Um, the best results have been with marginally use, useful things, enhanced um, search and some silly, silly, playful things like this. So this is where, similar to Cooper Hewitt, we had uh, works from the collection with very, very minimal metadata, and we would or works from the collection with uh, metadata but without images. So we were using the images we had to generate um, collection descriptions, which are quite, a, quite, quite amusing. Uh, this is from 2020, or vice versa, 
feeding it a collection de 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 description and getting it to uh, generate an image where we didn't have rights to show an image. Um, we also did some work about auto with auto kind of generated captioning, which three years ago was pretty poor. But much as we see uh, with investment schemes, past, past performance is not a guarantee of future results. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, the teams launched this. So now you can search within the ACME collection for, for moments where words are said. So here's, this is, it's quite slow. So this is searching for the word rage. And we see here in this uh, video from the, the his, history of the Water, Waterside Workers Federation, we will see in a second. <laughs> They may blast the scream and rage. I just turn another page. So uh, it's even transcribed for us uh, a unionist singing, a union song. Um, so I think that's super interesting, and that's giving us new, new ways of think, think, thinking about the ways future users may navigate their collection. No, no one would have otherwise searched for that and, um, unless they were searching for. His, his, the his, history of the union, uh, the union of movement in Australia, or waterside, waterside workers, or these, these sorts of things. But now we can connect that to all of these other videos. Now this is because we've had in-house um, um, in capabilities, and we've been building and doing a lot of kind of work on, in, on these, in, these internal tech, technical literacies to make, make sense of it all. Um, and whilst it does open up new uh, vectors for exploring this, um, a lot of what I've shown you doesn't fun, f fun, uh, fundamentally change the power, kind of the, the, the power relationships between the museum in, and, and its collection and the, and the, and the public. Um, the curators and regist re regist registration staff, and myself too, do have a concern around the shifting of skills from collection-specific knowledge to this very data-centric view of culture, a quantitative view of uh, value, too. Um, and we like to see what we've thought about in the past was this people, stories, and objects, but now we're seeing this reversal of that process, too. And I think that double model is quite exciting. This is an Indigenous artist, uh, Joel kind of Sherwood Spring, who's also been questioning through one of our commissions of one of his works um, about um, the extractive and material nature of te technology too. My name is Joel Sherwood Spring. I am a Wiradjuri up. artist based on uh, Gadigal, Wangal um, country in the Eora Nation. I am a part of um, the exhibition, How I See It. I am producing a video work called Digger Mode. One of the main questions in Digger Mode is the ways in which materials, like physical stuff, are implicated in the ways that we imagine the world. How we might engage with materials differently if we think about their provenance and where they come from, where they're extracted from, and what that means going forward. It's interesting to experiment with the ways in which we represent technology and the technological advancements that bring us shiny, high definition, interesting, thought provoking images. Can you bring an AI into recognition of itself as being made up of lithium extracted from Nungabuja? And why is it that we afford personality and humor and ideas to these very new things that are mainly made up of electrical signals and rocks. Why is it more socially acceptable to think that an AI has feelings and thoughts than a tree? <laughs> the body is always close, you know, the body is always near to these things. We're in relation with this stuff in a way that could be different because the ways that we relate to them now are constructed. If it's just an ideological construction, and we want to continue to live on this planet, then we need to think more deeply about how we relate to our material world. Language is power, language models are power, and compute capacity is also power now. These services that generate our tech technologies, and particularly the AI tools we've seen in the last week, need huge computational resources that are own, own, only available to a uh, few. And despite the rhetoric of decentralization, there is enormous centralization going on. Public computational capacity, and I would, would also say that 
wife, 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 uh, Wi-Fi was an was an Australian in in invention that came out of public research. So public computational capacity is limited, following decades of neo kind of um, 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 of neo kind of liberalism, and a lack of invest uh, um, a lack of invest uh, lack of invest vest, uh, lack of investment in public infrastructure. In Australia, this this may able to be revived. Your, your mileage may kind of vary in other places. <laughs> um, for museums, I'm interested in how we, su we support creative practices of the future, but for the audiences of the, f of the future. What are the new kind of literacies we, we need and how do the public creators and cultural, cultural, cultural workers like, like us, as Joel points out, distingu distinguish modern tech technologies from magic. How do we shift our focus from the technologies of data, metadata and, and, and information to world building narrative emotion and imagination? We talk a lot about data in the last couple of weeks. And in order to, and in order to do this, I think we need to collaborate across the arts and cultural sector, not just within museums, but across the entirety of glam and also performing arts and other cultural practices too. So the big issues for me, and I'm just wrapping up now, just as a list, are these par uh, paradoxes, open and closed, scar scarcity, energy, computational capacity, collective and civic infrastructure, the equity and access tools. These are super important. And whilst we may be in the early stages of a quantum shift, there are multiple presents. There are also multiple futures. We have a choice in this. Thank you. Oh, thank you.